It is good to be back with you today. I'm glad that Mike was able to fill in last week. Missed you all, but I heard that um, you did a really good job. Brian didn't miss me at all. <laughs> but I picked up a lot of uh, good material last weekend. And one of the things that struck me happens to fit in with what we we're going to do today, and I've realized that we really do kind of have a series that we've sort of backed into. Uh, you, maybe you can see that the series title is Hard Text for Hard Times. The comment that I heard last weekend was about how as preachers we have a tendency not to go into the Old Testament all that much, and maybe that's because it really is harder. It's harder to, to preach from. And I was looking at the lectionary readings coming up for the next few weeks, and I thought, yeah, these are some kind of hard passages. But at the same time, you know, we've got the Old Testament. Uh, it's background. It's not just background. They are the scriptures from which Jesus taught, with which he was familiar. They were the scriptures that were quoted uh, by the, uh, the New Testament writers. In fact, for the first uh, two or three hundred years of the church's history, we really didn't have that much of the New Testament that was set. Now, the letters were there, but what the early church used to a great degree were the Psalms and the Old Testament readings. And I thought, okay, this is something that we really should dig into a bit. And given that today is... Father's Day, a day of celebration, but also a day that for a lot of us is hard for a lot of reasons. Uh, perhaps we've lost our fathers. Uh, perhaps some of our earthly fathers were broken people who were not uh, the best. But then we also had those fathers who were leaders, who took care of us, who nurtured us. Uh, it, it's a mixed day for a lot of folks. When we look in the Old Testament, one of the things that strikes me, that for me helps to show indeed this is the Word of God, is that we don't find the people being painted as being perfect. We find human weaknesses there. We're going to be with Abraham for a little bit over the next two or three weeks, and we're going to see that there were some challenges that Abraham had in his family. We're looking at two passages from Genesis today, actually. Genesis chapter 18, the first 15 verses, and then we'll skip ahead to the culmination of something that was predicted there by turning to Genesis chapter 21. But before I do that, I wanted to kind of put in context. And, you know, again, this is one of those things I've known, but it really kind of had escaped my attention. I think most of us are familiar with the... the um, the Genesis record of Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, the three visitors that, uh, that came, uh, the two who went on to Sodom. Somehow I had forgotten that this is all part of the same story. The three visitors that we find coming here in Genesis 18 went on to that valley. And so we'll be looking over the next two or three weeks about how some of this stuff kind of ties together. But today, we turn to Genesis 18, verses 1 through 15 to begin with. You'll find it printed in your bulletin. Uh, and I do feel like I need to apologize just a little bit. In order to get it all in, we had to use 10-point type. So it's a little harder to read than usual. If you need to uh, find a pew Bible to read along with... Uh, or if you would like to just listen to the word. It says, The Lord appeared to Abraham at the oaks of Mamre while he sat at the entrance of his tent in the day's heat. He looked up and suddenly saw three men standing near him. As soon as he saw them, he ran from his tent entrance to greet them and bowed deeply. He said, Sirs, if you would be so kind, don't just pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought so that you may wash your feet and refresh yourselves under the tree. Let me offer you a little bread so you will feel stronger. And after that, you may leave your servant and go on your way since you have visited your servant. They responded, 
fine, do just as you have said. Now let's pause here for just a second and note that the custom of the time was almost a minimum kind of thing when people were traveling. If you were going to extend hospitality, offer them water and offer them bread. And notice that that's what Abraham has done. But then notice what Abraham does next. So Abraham hurried to Sarah at his tent and said, Hurry, knead three seers of the finest flour and make some baked goods. Abraham ran to the cattle, took a healthy young calf and gave it to a young servant who prepared it quickly. Then Abraham took butter, milk, and the calf that had been prepared, put the food in front of them, and stood under the tree near them as they ate. Notice that he went above and beyond, you see, beyond what the minimum was. They said to him, where's your wife, Sarah? And he said, right here in the tent. And again, as we pause, does it occur to anybody why Abraham didn't say, how do you know my wife's name? Little indication here, you see. Verse 10, then one of the men said, I will definitely return to you about this time next year. Then your wife, Sarah, will have a son. Sarah was listening at the tent door behind him. Now, Abraham and Sarah were both very old. Sarah was no longer menstruating. So Sarah laughed to herself, thinking, I'm no longer able to have children, and my husband's old. The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Me give birth at my age? Is anything too difficult for the Lord? When I return to you about this time next year, Sarah will have a son. Sarah lied and said, I didn't laugh because she was frightened. But he said, No, you laughed. And then we skip ahead, chapter 21. The Lord was attentive to Sarah, just as he had said, and the Lord carried out just what he had promised her. She became pregnant and gave birth to a son for Abraham when he was old, at the very time God had told him. God named his son, the one Sarah bore him, Isaac. Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, just as God had commanded him. Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born. Sarah said, God has given me laughter. Everyone who hears about it will laugh with me. She said, who could have told Abraham that Sarah would nurse sons, but now I've given birth to a son when he was old. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And since we don't have the original language in front of us, it's worthwhile noting that the name Isaac means laughter. This is why Isaac was named as he was. As we so often say, there's a lot here. We only have time to dig a little bit into it. I do feel like we need to give a bit of context here, although this is Abraham and Sarah's first son. It's not Abraham's first son. Abraham, along with uh, Sarah's servant, Hagar, had a son a few years earlier that they named Ishmael. When Abraham was at the young age of 86. Not too long ago, there was something in the news about Robert De Niro having a son, and I think he's in his 80s, right? So for Abraham to be 86 and having had no children yet... And we don't know much about Hagar. We'll actually go back and take a look at that story because you do the math, that tells you that, uh, that uh, Ishmael was about 15 years old when Isaac was born. And that's going to come into our story a little bit later on. But today, of course, we're looking at this story of the, the visit of these three coming to Abraham's tent 
It tells us in verse 1, the Lord appeared, and then it switches to talking about these three men, but then it goes back to one of them saying these things to Abraham. I'm not sure when Abraham figured out who he was talking with. We have on the front of our bulletin uh, folks who are with us audio only are not seeing, of course, although uh, for at least one outlet for the audio, you can see the album cover, so to speak. Uh, This is a reproduction of a famous painting by Rembrandt, Abraham visiting with the angels, as it says. Uh, And I'll get a little academic here, I guess. Scholars look at certain incidents in the Old Testament and refer to them as theophanies, that is, appearances of God. Some refer to those appearances as Christophanies, that is, uh, that the Christ, the Son, visited earth at times prior to the incarnation. It was in the incarnation of Jesus that God came and lived as one of us. But certainly God knew our circumstances. We find a few incidents in the Old Testament where the Lord in some fashion visited among humans. And this was one of them. And so I think if we look at that painting, we can kind of tell which one is supposed to be representative of the Lord, the the shining one. I mentioned Sodom and Gomorrah when we, um, that, that's, that's only going to be peripherally referred to in the next two or three weeks. But I do note that when the angels went to Sodom and Gomorrah and were subject to the hospitality lot, there was only two of them. So again, you know, we'll talk about that later. Hospitality comes into both of those stories, though. And so here we find Abraham offering this hospitality. Uh, as uh, Ellen noted, as we were talking about Psalm, you know, this is the story, in a way, the story of Abraham becoming a father. He had been a father, but this is the father of uh, what would become the nation of Israel, as well as several other nations. 100 years old. Now, I can just imagine Sarah, and again, looking at Rembrandt's painting, can you kind of see her off over there to the side, kind of listening? And so it says in verse 10 that she was listening at the tent door behind him. And when she heard this prediction, oh, 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 we can just imagine. Uh, As a matter of fact, to me, it says something about the lack of, of belief that she at whatever her age would be I think we could go back and kind of figure out how old but she's been his wife for a long time she's bound to be in her 60s at least the lack of faith is shown in the fact that she laughed as opposed to going what I mean think about those of you who've known me for a while, you know our youngest is now 20 years old, but the next older one is uh, 34, I think. There is a bit of a gap there. And Hannah was planned. Several of you have grown up with brothers and sisters, and you know when you're close in age to each other, uh, sometimes there's a question as to whether all will make it to adulthood without taking one or the other of them out. But it seems when there is quite a gap there that those those older children wind up really kind of taking care of those young kids. You know, when Hannah was born, um, Zach was 14. And he just jumped right in there and took care of her. And to this day, he is sort of her guardian angel. But I have to say, we did find a little different dynamic going on in the household of Abraham. So here's where it begins. It begins in laughter. It begins in disbelief. And yet, at the same time, 
it impresses me that when this comes about, and again, keeping track of, of the, the chronology here, we find these three visiting with Abraham. We know that uh, Sodom and Gomorrah comes after this. After that story, Abraham and Sarah go to uh, Abimelech, and there's a whole drama that goes on around that. And it's a year later that we find chapter 21 here. And it turns out just exactly as the Lord had promised. To Sarah's credit, she not only recognizes the laughter, she names her son in honor of the laughter that she delivered, but also that God turned around. I think this laughter turned from laughter of disbelief, the <laughs> you have got to be kidding, to the laughter of celebration. Human laughter is an interesting thing. You see, we, we laugh when we're scoffing at something, but we also laugh in joy. And ultimately, this thing that Sarah did not think could possibly happen, happened. Verse 14, is anything too difficult for the Lord? And this verse has been held out to us today. Because I think a lot of times we look at circumstances and we say, well, it's got to turn out this way or that way or the other. Things are so hard. Things are so difficult. What's happening with the church at large? What's happening with our culture, with our society? What's happening with our congregation right here? Certain things that we might think are inevitable that are already done in a way. Is anything too difficult for the Lord? May we turn from the laughter of disbelief to the laughter of joy. Would you bow with me? Father, indeed, as humans, we have trouble believing. But, Father, we can put one foot in front of the other. We can put our trust in you as we recognize that these things do not come about through our own efforts, but rather, Father, in our service to your leading. Each week, Father, we are praying that we don't know what to do, but you do. Open us, Father, to the path that you put before us. We ask these things in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen.